Everyone, me, Kevin here. Look, I just have to say I am sorry the market has been a little red the last few days. I did go on vacation again. I was just in New York City and now I'm in Germany. Uh, but don't worry, after Germany, I only have a couple more stops and that's Paris uh, and, then, and then London. So, uh, you know, w we should have an okay month, but um, if it's bumpy, I just want to apologize in advance. And the best thing you can do is take advantage of that 50% off coupon code. Okay, great. Now, let's talk about what's actually going on in the market. First thing we need to talk about is retail capitulation. Because, well, first of all, a lot of you like the updates on retail capitulation because everybody is kind of hoping for everybody else to just quickly dump and sell. We want to see the volatility index go from where it is now, which is like slightly elevated to like that. So that way we know, okay, great. Maybe this is the cathartic flush out where everybody dumps. The Dow is down like seven to 10% of the day. We have the circuit breakers going off and then that's our signal to buy, but we're not getting that. In fact, if anything, we've got more stocks moving above their 50-day moving average now than we've had previously, uh, which is kind of wild because it's like, wait, wait, what, like, how are we bouncing off the bottom? Like, we haven't hit peak inflation yet. Like, we haven't gone through the earnings season yet. Like, oh no. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe, who knows, and I hate this phrase, maybe this time is different, uh, but uh, retail ain't capitulating, at least not yet. In fact, let me tell you exactly how many days in the last six months, retail have been net sellers. Now remember what that means, okay? So like if retail buys, uh, I don't know, $1.9 billion of stocks and they sell $4 billion of stocks, that means they bought $1.5 billion of stocks, right? Because this number is positive, it means that they were net buyers as a whole, retail. And so uh, how many days has retail been a neg, or, or a ne essentially how many days has that number been negative in the last six months? Zero, literally zero. <laughs> like retail is not interested in capitulating. In fact, the 10 day moving average is that retail is a selling about 41.8% of the time. And this is how we're ending up as net buyers. So really kind of interesting. In fact, that there are a few charts that we could look at as well that'll give us a little bit more color on uh, what retail is up to. And I tell you, I love keeping an eye on what retail is up to, but let's go ahead and pull up some charts here. So let's see what we got. So the first thing we have here is uh, the inflows chart. And this just shows you since March 22nd, what kind of inflows we've had into, in this case, leveraged ETFs, which is sort of an additional data point for us beyond what I just talked about. Uh, and, and this really shows that we still have this bottom here being zero. We almost had a negative day here for leveraged ETFs. Uh, and uh, this, this was over here when the SPY was actually at its lowest point. We saw the least amount of buying on that leveraged ETF. Usually, uh, we get a lot of buy the dipping happening. See, like take a look at this dip right here and this massive move right here into, uh, uh, into leveraged ETFs. Same thing over here, you see the dip here, boom, massive buying. See this big drop right here? Boom, massive moves into the leveraged ETFs. We get a little rally here. Here, you actually almost had a little bit of panic is what it looks like. Uh, you got a little bit of buy the dipping right here. But once we were in that hole, people were like, oh man, oh no, 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 we're nervous. So you almost had some level of capitulation there uh, looking at uh, leveraged ETFs. This would usually be like your three times NASDAQ or whatever, right? Uh, then we've also got a little bit of insight into kind of some of the hot stocks uh, retail is looking at right now. Faraday Futures, uh, definitely a stock you're seeing a big move on here. And it's, there's probably also a reason for this. It's probably high short interest, which we've been kind of tracking the short interest on these for a while. In fact, one of the favorites that we used to track uh, was Go EV. Remember Canoe? Yeah, this company is one that uh, issued a notice in their filings that they have a serious going concern, which is just a way of prepping you to say that they might go bankrupt. Uh, this is a company we've been watching for a very long time. I was briefly an investor in this company, but uh, we really doubted their ability to turn their manufacturing around. And this is why we talked about, okay, yeah, no, we're selling this one, which obviously I'm very glad I did because it's fallen substantially. Uh, but it recently has popped up from its lows in the twos to over $4 now. Uh, it's up over 100% in just the last five days. 
And so I think what's happening is you're going to find uh, pushes for little short squeezes. And right now it seems to be happening in the autos, Go EV, Faraday Futures. So you're seeing a lot of retail activity there in these as little spec plays. Uh, and then, of course, over here, you've got your retail buying. The more to this side they are, the more retail buying is happening. So if you zoom in here, you can see Amazon here, Tesla, DoorDash, Shopify, Costco. Uh, we did have news, by the way, and I don't, I don't have that here yet because that news just came out and this, this is yesterday's, but uh, every, I get this sort of chart here, what retail did the day after, right? That makes sense. But anyway, um, BYD, you might actually have uh, Warren Buffett potentially selling out of uh, this company, this Chinese auto manufacturer, a stake that matches Warren Buffett's uh, share size of around 20%. Nobody else has that same share size. Hit the uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange and folks are like, oh my gosh, Buffett is weenie baby paper handing. Uh, yeah, kind of wild. But anyway, uh, a lot of folks have had a lot of uh, enthusiasm for uh, for that particular company, and uh, a lot of folks have been following Warren Buffett's. Uh, you know, well, people like to say riding Warren Buffett's coattails, uh, but uh, the stock's down 10% right now on this potential that Warren Buffett is uh, dumping his shares or has dumped his shares. Uh, anyway, okay, so this is a, a little bit on retail here. Now, this is a pretty cool chart. This chart shows you the percentage of companies selling in the S&P 500 above their 50-day moving average. And when you get really low, like over here in this 10 to 20% range, it really means that every, uh, or, or the vast majority of companies in the index, the S&P 500, are falling. And so this is where you get uh, real sort of pain points. And you can kind of see that end of January, uh, February was relatively painful, May and June, pretty painful here. We did have that post-Fed March meeting that had a really nice two-week rally coming after that. I remember at the end of March saying, this is not sustainable, like we've got a lot more pain ahead of us. And uh, well, sure enough, we came off of that and we saw a substantial amount of uh, selling again. And we even saw lower lows in May and June. But what we've seen now is we're almost at 50% of companies now moving above their 50-day moving average. So you're definitely seeing some sort of rebound. You're seeing uh, that buy the dip activity. You're seeing retail still moving strong. And some folks are saying, hey, you know what? Look at companies like Amazon right now and Shopify, Wayfair, Etsy. These companies have all bled out since the beginning of the year, but it almost feels like we're kind of hitting this plateau over here, this shelf, and this could be creating an opportunity to finally get back into these. In fact, some of these names are in the M1 Finance Pie that we've assembled with course members and some fundamental analysis that we've been doing, which we try to do every day the market's open in our course member live streams. Make sure to take advantage of that expiring 50% off coupon code. The price will be ticking up again. You lock in the best price when you check out on these programs. And keep in mind, you probably will get your money back and much, much, much more in the courses. It's solely based on the fact that when you join the courses, you get a Lowe's for Pros partnership that gets you discounts on a lot of products at Lowe's. Big fan of Lowe's, especially in our rental renovations course. And of course, uh, if we can help you build wealth by buying wedge deals in real estate or uh, doing the best that you can do by getting perspective in the stock market, getting the education that we can share, folks, I, I think you're going to love it. And I'm very confident of that. So we'll see you there. Now, the next thing that we really need to talk about is what the bond market is telling us about the market. Because look, retail's not capitulating, but maybe they're stupid to not capitulate. Maybe retail should sell, right? And remember, retail is any individual. An institution would be a company, right? So retail is any individual. Why is retail not capitulating? Well, maybe it's because the bond market is telling us, hey, inflation's going to be transitory, at least eventually. Now, this seems pretty wild. Wild, but the bond market is now starting to price in real yields into the future. Real yields are really important to be priced into the future because we have never seen the Federal Reserve U-turn and soften 
without real yields being positive. Now, the first chart that's super critical to understand is the five-year break-even chart. This is the market's expectation for inflation. And look at where we have fallen to, folks. This is a new low. We are now lower than at any point we have been in 2022. This is huge. This is the market telling us that in all of 2022, all of this area over here, we had more fear about inflation than we do now. In other words, we think we're at the cusp of a turn, a massive drop in inflation. Just the other day, I showed a chart that lined up, this is why you wanna watch every day, that lined up the five-year break-even and the 10-year break-even with CPI. And you saw a direct correlation between when the five and 10-year break-even plummeted, CPI plummeted soon after that. So the bond market is pricing in that inflation is about to dump. But before that happens, the bond market is also telling us, hey, we've got an inverted yield curve, which means that we're fearful that we might see a recession. The white line here is the inverted yield curve, and it is inverted anytime it is under this approximate red line-ish that I drew there. Uh, it's a little higher than where it should be, but it's close enough. And uh, there is a fear that we could actually see the Fed continue to be aggressive to the point where the yield curve actually inverts to something like uh, what happened in the early 90s. Uh, which is a pretty good inversion, four tenths of, uh, of a percent. Now, what's actually kind of neat about that kind of inversion is we ended up having a soft landing in the mid-90s from the Federal Reserve. Now, remember, folks, the Fed has never gone soft on us without real yields being positive. Well, take a look at this. The futures market has finally priced in positivity. This is good. This means positive real yields in the future. Now here's how that works. So let's just say the yield on the two year treasury is 3% and inflation is let's say 2.75% next year. Well now you have a yield on that treasury of about a quarter of a percent. That is a real positive yield. And why is that so important? Again, because the Fed has never gone soft on us without having this positive arrow right here. That's really, really critical because if that stayed negative, which it has been for a while, then we know the Fed still has to get more aggressive on us. Now, at the same time, crude oil is finally falling. Thank goodness, WTI is down to 96.6. This will help inflation plummet in the next few months. A lot of this is happening because folks believe that Europe is going into recession and they're probably going to have a deeper recession than us in America. I'm in Europe right now and I'll let you know what I see when I actually get out and about. I kind of just checked into the hotel room and I'm like, I gotta update the subscribers. And the non-subscribers, you know, some of you watch who aren't subscribers. There are even haters who watch. And you know what? Uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. You know, it's okay to hate. Uh, just don't lie. Just don't lie. It's okay to hate. Just don't lie. So uh, then we've got our earnings coming up. And this is going to be really interesting because there are a few things we're going to watch for earnings. Uh, number one, we really want to pay attention to pricing power. Now, one of the reasons I flip-flopped and sold in January and then said I would rebuy, which I wanna just take a moment to make that very clear. Remember what I said on January 22nd. I said that I sold, uh, and I sold on the 21st, right? I told course members here, I planned my video for the next day, and I told everybody about it here. I said that I would sell because companies have too much pricing power, inflation is going to last substantially longer, things are going to get a lot worse before they get better, and then I'm going to rebuy within 60 days. Uh, and so that's what I've done. I've flipped back into the market about 80%, which wasn't another flip-flop, it was, it was me doing what I said I was going to do because I wanted to buy when prices are cheaper. And sure, some things have gone a little bit lower, but that's okay because I'm still buying and I've got some cash right now, so I'm still ready to buy in case we get that VIX spike and we get that cathartic flush out we talked about earlier, right? So uh, pricing power was one of the big reasons that I originally sold. And so what we really kind of want to see is that uh, companies that we're not invested in are losing pricing power because uh, selfishly, that means those companies can help us get inflation down because they'll start dropping prices. Like you want to see the Walmarts and the, the Targets and stuff dropping prices uh, because that's going to help bring inflation down, right? Obviously, companies you're investing in, you want to see remaining pricing power and margins that are up, right? Right. 
But another thing that we want to see, obviously, uh, in addition to uh, margins, is we want to see what the banks are doing. And we've got some big earnings coming out this week uh, from uh, not only Delta, uh, this is going to be the airlines, we'll talk about them in a sec, but we've got JPM and Morgan Stanley releasing earnings this week. Now, this is really, really important because what I specifically want to look for here is number three, allowance for credit losses. Okay, these are really, really, really important because if JPM and Morgan Stanley go, okay, yeah, look, we know we're going into a recession. We're gonna take massive credit losses because we expect or we're already starting to see increasing default rates or whatever. That's gonna potentially forecast how deep the banks think the recession is going to get. Remember what they did in COVID. When COVID hit, the banks took like billions. I mean, up you know, in, in one quarter, they're like, we're just gonna write off $5 billion in credit losses just to take the loss now and assume that people are just not gonna pay back their debts. And yeah, it's gonna suck. Of course, the Fed basically bailed everyone out and the banks are like, okay, I guess we can take those back as earnings now, which is kind of cool. And that's why the banks did well later in 2020 and, and early in 2021, and then kind of like softened from there. But uh, these banks are really gonna let us know a lot about the consumer. I expect the earnings calls to be critical in terms of uh, insight for how the consumer is doing, but uh, really wanna watch those allowances for credit losses because if they don't have big allowances for credit losses, then it's kind of like, really? Like you say, you have a risk of a recession, but like you're not pricing it in. So like, which is it, right? So that's gonna be really interesting. And will show us, are we gonna have like a minor recession? Is this gonna be a technical recession? Or are we gonna have a deep recession? Also, what are they saying about housing? I mean, obviously we know the mortgage departments are gonna get crushed. The trading departments for like retail clients are gonna get crushed, I think. Uh, you know, the, the uh, trading activities maybe within their hedge funds, uh, within the, the banks, the hedge departments at the banks might do decently. But these, these earnings, I think are gonna be very, very, very critical. And they're gonna set the stage for the rest of the earnings season. Uh, of course, Delta, it'd be kind of interesting to see what they're seeing, if, if we can get like a demographic breakdown of like who's spending money, how's travel in Europe versus America. I was just on a Delta flight, uh, going to New York and uh, uh, you know, the, the I have to say both my, oh, this is actually quite interesting. Even though we have all of these staff shortages, my flight to New York had quite a few open seats and my flight from uh, JFK to Frankfurt also had quite a few open seats. Like they definitely didn't fully sell out uh, the plane uh, or the business class section, which which I was kind of surprised by because I feel like usually they just like free upgrade people to the business class section instead of leaving seats empty. But uh, no, there, there were definitely seats empty. So that's quite interesting. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor also reports on, uh, on Thursday. So JPM's Thursday, Delta is Wednesday morning, JPM Thursday morning, you've got Morgan Stanley Thursday morning, and uh, Taiwan Semiconductor's Thursday morning. That's gonna be fascinating too for AMD and NVIDIA players, because I really think the chip market still has pain coming ahead of it. Uh, especially as the demand that we're getting for chips has slowed down substantially from the crypto department, you know, whether it's the uh, ASICs for Ethereum or the graphic cards for Bitcoin, whatever, right? We've also seen just a slowdown in uh, overall uh, chip stockpiling because we're, we are starting to see some form of demand slowdown for like at home PCs, right? So this will be very, very interesting to see how TSM does and that'll be a big precursor for the entire chip industry. We have been seeing used chip prices fall as well on eBay. I mean, it's been straight down. Uh, we do, so, so that'll be interesting. We did also get an update that Peloton is bringing their production, well, they used to have their production in-house. Now they've decided to actually outsource their production to Rexon Industrial, a Taiwanese company. I, you know, they, they had a lot of some product issues. They had rust issues, rust gate issues about covering up these rust, rust issues. But what I thought was weird about this Peloton uh, now wanting to, to outsource their manufacturing, what I thought was weird about that is they freaking bought Precore. Like it should be easy for them to manufacture uh, fitness equipment. And Precore was a big part of the Peloton uh, uh, appeal because Precore could get Peloton into strength training. And uh, I mean, Precore already makes high quality gym equipments. Just ty Google, type into Google Precore uh, gym equipment and then you'll see and be like, oh yeah, I've seen that at like every hotel I ever go to. It's like really high quality stuff. So I thought that was kind of weird. Uh, we are on the uh, eve of CPI release. I will try to live stream the CPI release tomorrow. It'll be the afternoon here in Germany. I will try to uh, do so. 
CPI could end up coming in as high as 9%. The Bloomberg consensus right now, of course, is 8.8%. And of course, uh, we were at 8.6% last month. So if we get a nine banger, boy, it's just going to make uh, Biden quite sad. That's for darn sure. But uh, no, it's going to make a lot of people quite sad. Uh, we do have the Federal Reserve Bank also giving us a little bit of an update. We've got uh, Mr. Bostick from Atlanta telling us that the U.S. economy can cope with higher interest rates. And at the same time, you've got Esther George, who voted against the 75 BP hike last month, suggesting, hey, we got to be careful into tightening too fast. Although, like we saw yesterday, folks like Bill Gross are like, come on, folks, get us to three and a half percent and then just flatline. Will you, Fed? Just like stop BSing us. OK, we got serious problems here. So anyway, that gives you an overall update. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm going to clean this board and now I'm going to go walk around the city. All right. I appreciate you all. If there's breaking news. Maybe I'll go film from a different location. But I really like this board. And uh, sorry, I'm on vacation to make your stocks drop. But, you know, maybe you can leave me a thank you for giving you some deals uh, like the 50% off coupon code. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Bye.